Well, we did the bees, we did the woods, and now we're going to do the whales. Okay, Professor Bostic, save it for the summer. <laughs> we're about to start uh, our next presentation uh, with Professor Hill's group and their presenter, Michael, are you ready? Let's go. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Celitano, and I'm here today to present my team's implementation plan for the Save Right Whales Act. Here's a preview for what this presentation will be about today. I'm going to start by giving some background on the right whale population crisis and then the legislative action that has been taken to address this crisis, including the more specific components of the bill, uh, including the grant program and plankton survey that we hope will help save the North Atlantic right whale. A great introduction to this species is the story of Kingfisher. Kingfisher was born in 2004 off the U.S. East Coast, and before he could turn one year old, he became entangled with rope and fishing line that wrapped around his body and dragged behind him for over 100 yards. This hindered his ability to play with other juvenile whales, feed, and even reach the surface of the ocean to breathe. Thankfully, a team from NOAA and the United States Coast Guard were able to partially disentangle Kingfisher in 2005. But as you can see in this picture, some rope remained entangled around his right fin. And this rope, since then, has increasingly tightened around the fin, leaving an open wound that is at risk for infection. Because of this infection risk, um, researchers did not think that Kingfisher would live for very many years. However, he has proven them wrong, and he's still alive today. But the infection risk remains, and it means that Kingfisher will very likely never reach the full lifespan of a North Atlantic right whale, which is about 70 years, or the full size of a North Atlantic right whale, which is about the size of a school bus. Kingfisher is a member of a species that has undergone several population threats over the last few hundred years. As you can see in this graph with the number of living whales on the y-axis and the year on the x-axis, whaling activities in the 17 and 1800s decimated the population of North Atlantic right whales to less than 100 whales by 1900. The small population managed to survive until legal protections were applied in the 1970s, and there was a very slight population recovery. But as you can see in the graph, the population recovered nowhere close to the tens of thousands of whales that once inhabited the Atlantic Ocean. Looking at the more zoomed in timeline in the last 20 years, you can also see that the population has been declining since around 2010, and this includes a 15% population loss since 2015, which for a human perspective is the loss of over a billion people. The reason this more current extinction crisis is happening is due to a number of drivers. The Gulf of Maine, which is where the whale feeds mainly, has warmed rapidly in recent years, and this has led for the, to the whale's main food source of plankton to shift northward towards unprotected waters. The whales have followed their food source, and as a result, they've become prone to more entanglements and ship strikes, which has led to numerous deaths in recent years, including 10 deaths so far in 2019, leaving to a population currently of around only 400 individuals. And this has led many researchers to believe there's an uncertain future currently for the whale, and it could go extinct as soon as within 20 years. To solve this problem, the goal of our policy is to assist in the conservation of North Atlantic right whales by supporting and supplying financial resources. More specifically, the bill is composed, has three components. The first is a sense of Congress that prioritizes the whale and makes it <clears throat> prioritizes it as an endangered species that needs to be conserved. And the second is a grant program that will fund conservation projects for the whale. And the third component is a bilateral plankton survey that is done with Canada and the United States in order to better understand the whale's critical food supply. This is a 10-year, $54 million program, and annually it accounts for less than 1% of Congress's total spending on endangered species conservation. Because there's such a dire need for conservation, we've decided that our first year objectives will revolve around recovery, rescue, and disentanglements. We've set a project ceiling for our grant program at a million dollars, and we've done this in order to diversify the amount of projects we can fund through the program. And because there is such an urgent need for conservation, we've also allocated a million dollars into an emergency rescue and relief fund that can be used at any time so that whale rescues and disentanglements like the one you see in this picture can be funded and effective. 
NOAA Fisheries was a natural choice as the organization to implement our program. NOAA Fisheries is staffed by the leading right whale experts in the federal government who have worked on right whale conservation projects for two decades. NOAA Fisheries also has the resources needed to disentangle and rescue right whales, including the Atlantic Large Whale Disentanglement Network, which involves 20 organizations dedicated to disentangling whales in the Atlantic Ocean. No Fisheries has worked on North Atlantic right whale conservation for 50 years, and it also has an office that is advantageously located adjacent to the whale's critical feeding grounds off the coast of Maine. Using NOAA Fisheries means that we're only going to have to hire one consultant to implement this program, and this maximizes our potential to achieve our program's objectives. Moving to our grant program, we've timed the program in a way to best benefit the North Atlantic right whale. There will be a two-month application period for the grants, as well as a one-month review period so the experts at NOAA can review all of the proposals and make sure that they prioritize the grant projects that align with our first-year objectives of rescue, recovery, and disentanglement. And we've allocated $4 million annually towards this grant program. The plankton survey is another aspect of the bill, and it involves Calanus finmartesis, which is the whale's main food source and is a species of plankton that the, the whale feeds on when the plankton is at its most abundant in the surface ocean and also the largest in its life cycle. Whales need to eat a lot of this species of plankton in order to migrate down to Georgia in the summer, and in order to reproduce, the whales need to eat a lot of plankton. If they do not eat enough, they will not reproduce. So we have chosen to allocate $300,000 to help fund the already occurring surveys by NOAA so we can better understand, one, where the plankton are, and two, how abundant they are in the oceans. And because there's already existing protections for these whales by NOAA, but the problem has been that the whales have moved into unprotected waters off the coast of Canada, we will be collaborating with NOAA's counterparts at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in Canada in order to create updated monitoring maps to understand where the plankton are. We will be measuring performance in this program in a number of different ways. Since this is a species conservation program, the number of disentanglements and whale rescues will be a major performance indicator for the program. Within the program, we will be measuring our success with quarterly progress reports that will be submitted by awardees to the staff at NOAA, as well as biannual financial reports to make sure that all financial assets have been allocated properly. NOAA staff will evaluate these reports and create an annual report that will then be produced and presented to the Department of Commerce and eventually to Congress. Our plankton maps will be another major performance indicator to show that we better understand the critical food supply. The first major milestone of our program will likely be the first whale that we're able to rescue or disentangle. As I've mentioned, this is a conservation program, so we're focused on saving the whales. When we allocate our full $5 million, it will represent another milestone because it will show that we've leveraged our existing resources to maximize our impact through the program. Updated monitoring maps will be another major milestone because it's going to allow us to better understand the whale's critical food supply. And lastly, population growth would be a major milestone for this program. This species has not experienced population growth in a decade. So within one year, if we're able to rescue enough whales and prevent enough deaths to lead to population growth, it will be a great first step in saving the right whales. We understand, however, that not all milestones will be deliverable on paper, and this picture of Kingfisher's disentanglement from 2005 serves as a great example that our program is dynamic and will rely on collaboration with multiple organizations and hundreds of dedicated individuals. We do not know a lot about right whales currently, and we understand that it is a daunting task to protect a species that we do not fully understand. However, we are confident that our current implementation plan, staffing, and budgeting gives us the best options to save the current and future generations of the North Atlantic right whale. I just want to say thank you to my team, my manager, Natalia, as well as the deputy manager, Alicia. It's been a great two semesters working on these projects. And I'll now field any questions. Thank you. Good job, Mike. Um, my question is, 
whether there are any other conservation organizations um, trying to conserve or protect um, the whales and the does interaction with those conservation organizations are within the scope of your program? Yeah, so there's dozens of NGOs that have been working on North Atlantic right whale uh, conservation, uh, including the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life, which is where I got the photo credit for this slide. Um, and we will be relying on these organizations um, and expecting several of them to be applying for some of our grants and using them uh, in our program to diversify the amount of people we have working on the conservation. Other questions? Um, thank you. Uh, is there any research uh, that, or regulation of the kinds of substances that go into the ropes and nets? Uh, like, they, are they biodegradable or all plastic? Um, I haven't looked at any specific research on biodegradable ropes. However, I, I'm fairly confident the current ropes are just your standard fishing line and nylon ropes. Um, they are working. Uh, there are several NGOs working on ropeless fishing technology as a solution. Um, however, this is far from to scale implementation. But I haven't seen anything about biodegradable ropes, and I'll be sure to look into it. Hi there. Um, during your uh, research, did you get a sense of what proportion of the mortality came from these entanglements versus the fish, uh, the ship strikes that you were uh, alluding to? Um, I don't have numbers on hand. However, more deaths are occurring due to the entanglements than the ship strikes. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. 